Well, first of all, let me say uh, personally how much I appreciate this congregation, especially for the family you were to our daughter last year when she came your way. She is doing great. She now has a job and is uh, just continuing on with her life. And you all came along in her life at, at a good time and were a great network of support for her. And I can't thank you enough, Tish and I can't thank you enough for the family that you have been and continue to be to Holly. But of course, I feel like uh, we're family because I've been coming here for like oh, since the 90s, uh, every year just about, I think. And, and so I have appreciation for the elderships of days going by as well as the one in the present, the preachers of days going by as well as your current preacher. I do believe and, and know that the legacy of this congregation is one that's built on a lot of hard work and a lot of tremendous devotion and dedication from a lot of different people including your, your current leadership and, and preacher and uh, climate here I know is, is one of lots of, uh, lots of work to do. So we're, we're all in this together and I look forward to growing together with you in years to come. I'm glad our students got to be here, but I'm glad I got to be here because I would have missed some great sermons, some great preaching. Preachers need to be preached to and uh, we often profit from these great sermons. And let me say one other uh, quick word. Uh, we'd love to have you come and be with us for our lectureship. It's always the last Sunday in March. The beginning point is always the last Sunday in March. And then it continues through Thursday. Uh, Brother Mosier does the directing of the lectureship and, uh, and uh, edits the book and does a lot of work in that department beyond what I could take the time to describe. As secular as our world is, isn't it time to get folks to focus on things eternal, to build their hopes on things eternal? I've noticed in several of the messages this week, Brother Taylor was mentioning last night in his message, several components. And that's going to be our theme for study next year, last Sunday in March. And we hope you can come and be a part of it. And one other quick word, just because uh, I think this may be the only chance I have to spread to you a, a bit of information that might help someone else learn the truth. Uh, the CounterPoint program that uh, Mike Hickson and I are privileged to do uh, has gone national now. How many of you have DirecTV? Anyone here DirecTV subscriber? Okay. If you have channel 376 then on Tuesday nights at 6 central this program airs. Any Dish Network customers in here? Dish Network? All right. Uh, 267 is your channel. Channel 267, 6 o'clock. And now it's going in, the signal at least, is going into 58 million homes. And I'll tell you why we're excited about that. In the local areas where the program has aired, we've had some wonderful success stories. My favorite is about a man that was uh, watching the program and he got mad and turned it off because he didn't like what we were saying about baptism. But then he wondered what we might be saying, so he turned it back on. And then he got mad and he turned it off. And then he wondered what we might be saying and so he turned it on and this time he started taking notes. And he took those notes to his denominational preacher and tried to get his preacher to address these passages that clearly showed the essentiality of baptism. His preacher dismissed it with a wave of a hand, had no interest in even discussing it. And so this man thought to himself, well, I'm going to find the church that put this truth out on the air because I've seen it in my Bible and I know it's there. And so this man led his family, I believe there were five of them if I'm remembering correctly, the first time they ever walked in the doors of the local Church of Christ building they went into, they came in carrying towels, each one of them, because they had come to be baptized that day into Christ for the remission of sins. Now, the gospel has tremendous power if you can just get it out there. And the first national airing that we had, after that program I just learned that there was a lady in Nashville, Tennessee, who watched us talking about the one church that you read about in the New Testament. And she said, well, 
That's right. It was the church of Christ that started in Acts 2 because to whom did the church belong? It belonged to Christ. So wouldn't that have been the church of Christ? And so with that in mind, after our program, she went, it aired on Tuesday, she went on Wednesday night to the Church of Christ in her neighborhood and she returned there on Sunday and she contacted GBN and Mike Hickson is getting with her and getting a packet of information from the church in Nashville to go and visit with her and talk to her. And so uh, that's just the beginning. We just started airing these nationally. Pray for this, tell others about it. I really believe one of the values of the program is people can tune in and eavesdrop on a Bible study and learn about things they might never have learned anywhere else. And so thank you for your uh, prayers on our behalf as we try to set forward that program. And thank you for taking such good care of our students here and giving us a wonderful uh, time to look forward to every year. Now my assigned subject has to do with strengthening our homes for the glory of God. And someone might say, well, do we really need to strengthen the American home? Well, I don't think many people would be asking that for very long. All you have to do is look around. And when you look around, you see some things that are very troubling, some things that are very upsetting. And do our homes need strengthening? You better believe they do. Because during the next 10 minutes that I speak to you, on the average, the following things will take place somewhere on the average in America every 10 minutes. Somewhere across this country over the next 10 minutes, 10 young people will attempt to commit suicide. There are 618 high school seniors who will smoke marijuana. There are 20 girls between ages 15 and 19 who will become pregnant or discover that they are. Five of those girls will give birth to their babies as unwed mothers. Eight of those girls will decide to have abortions. And when you think about abortion, you go back to 1981, and that's when ages 15 to 19, you had 433,330 abortions. That's a rate of 43.3 per 1,000 pregnancies. That's over 25% of the abortions that were performed in the United States during that given year. And by the way, you're looking at a picture on the screen, not of a newborn baby, this is a intrauterine photograph of a 16 week old baby in the womb. Tell me you're not looking at human being. Tell me you're not looking at someone made in the image of God. This is not fetal tissue. This isn't some kind of protoplasm that's just you know, there for the ride. This is a human being. And we need to come to grips with that. now. When you think about where we are versus where we've been, tell me we don't need to strengthen our homes. In the 1940s, school teachers were asked, please list your top seven problems that you have to deal with in your educational environment. And these are the lists they gave, talking in class, chewing gum, making noise, running in the halls, cutting in line, dress code violations, and littering. I'm not suggesting those would not be a potential interruption to the educational environment, but compare them to the survey that was done in the 1990s when this was the survey. Drug abuse, and they put alcohol abuse separately, but it is a drug, it belongs in category one. Pregnancy, suicide, rape, robbery, and assault. We've come a long way, baby, and it's not in a good direction. There is a problem going on in this country and we're spiraling downward and a moral uh, depravity is becoming more and more a part of us. I mean, did you ever think there would come a time when there would even be a debate about whether individuals should just choose the restroom of their own choice or the shower of their own choice? And now, just this week, the federal government has issued forth a decree that says that people should be able, and I don't know if you heard this part, they're not just talking about letting people choose the restroom of their choice, they're saying people ought to be able to use the shower of their choice as well in the school showers and places of that nature. And you, we have lost our minds. We've lost our minds. And it didn't happen overnight. There are all kinds of uh, drugs that have been inter 
introduced into our culture and you see just a listing of some of them. I'd like to stand here and tell you that I don't know any members of the church who have ever battled with any of this, but that wouldn't be true. Even long ago, and I've been going to a Christian camp in Knoxville, Tennessee to direct or help direct that camp every year since 1985. And during the time that I've been in attendance at this camp, I can tell you that just about every single one of these drugs on the screen has been a subject of discussion among young people with me. Either their friends were doing it or they had participated and they were feeling terribly guilty about it. Their parents didn't know. It was a, a very, very sad thing and this is a problem. And one out of every three teenagers has used an illicit drug within the past 30 days and one out of every 20 smokes marijuana every day on a daily basis and of course then there's alcohol. You think about alcohol, one in 20 seniors drinks it daily, about 92% of all high school seniors have used it at least once, 86% in the last year, 66% in the last month. It is a problem, it is an epidemic. And what can we do to strengthen the American home? We need to educate. Okay, now what do we use to do this? Go, with the, go to the bookstore with me. I want you to go to the bookstore with me and we call the clerk over. Come here, come here. Uh, we're here because we want to strengthen the American family. We want to strengthen the home wherever it might be found, not just in the U.S. of A., but across the world. Would you take us to the one book in your store, the one book in your store that would be the definitive authoritative manual for how to do that, please? Now, could they take me to bookshelf after bookshelf after bookshelf after bookshelf of books written about the home and the family? The, I mean, you, there would be tons and tons and tons of them to survey. How do you decide among all of these books which one is the definitive authoritative book? Well, I, we can make it rather easy. If they just take us to the 66 books called the Bible, we'd have what we need. And I'm not suggesting there aren't some good books based on biblical principles out there written about the home. But I'm telling you, if every uninspired book about how to have a strong home were to vanish off of the planet by this time tomorrow, if we still had the Bible, we would have all we need to have strong homes. This is it. And what we need to do is to educate people in the book that matters most. We glorify God. Not by turning to the books that are written by men, but we glorify God when we turn to the Bible, the one he wrote. And let me ask you, who designed man anyway? Who knows best about what makes man tick and how to raise a child? And you talk about glorifying God. We don't glorify God when we act like, hey, God, you know that method of discipline that you said to use in this book, this ancient antiquated book here, you know, that even includes uh, spanking occasionally? Well, God, I don't know how to tell you this, but we've advanced far beyond those days. Those are days of yesteryear, and we now know, does that glorify God to suggest that his method for teaching and discipline doesn't work? It doesn't glorify God. Glorifying God means taking him at his word and then getting that word into the hearts and minds of our young people. Now, you know the passage from Deuteronomy 6. And these words which I command thee this day. Now, parents, where does it start? I can't impart to others what I don't first possess myself. And so I have to get it into my own heart. These words which I command thee shall be in thine heart, the Bible heart not being the blood pump per se, but the mind of man connected to all of his emotions. Teach them diligently unto thy children and then talk of them when you're just sitting around in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down at night, when you get up in the morning. Those are the things that we ought to do according to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, what I find fascinating about this, he said, bind it upon your hand like a sign on your hand. You ever write anything down on your hand? Why? I want to remember this. I don't want to forget this. Let them be as frontlets right before your eyes so that you don't ever lose sight of this. And then the original post-it note. Thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house. 
Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9. Take this and make sure it is front and center. Now, have you ever thought that the preacher is repeating himself uh, too often and saying the same things over and over? Sometimes that is uh, because God has done that and the preacher is just reflecting that. Now, we just read from Deuteronomy 6. What is this? Ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when you sit in the house, and also, what? When you are walking by the way, when you rise up. These are the things from Deuteronomy chapter 11 that you read, and it's almost verbatim what you read in chapter 6. So why is God saying essentially the same exact words just five chapters apart through Moses? Moses, haven't you already preached this? Yes, I have, as a matter of fact. Well, I thought I'd heard that before, and I know you've heard about the preacher that uh, said, I'm going to keep preaching it until you finally start practicing it. Well, I'm not suggesting we go to that extreme, but I'm suggesting that the Bible does emphasize some things more than once. And then what about this passage from Psalm 78, which we have heard and known? Well, how did we learn it? Our fathers, notice, have told us. Now, what's our responsibility now that we've heard it? We will not hide them from their children, watch, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, his strength, his wonderful works that he has done. We need to make sure our children are learning the Bible in their Bible classes, but more than that, in the home. They need to be learning the Bible. I remember teaching a teenage class as a youth minister when I first started preaching. And I said to the young teenage class that was there, I said, you all remember the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, and they didn't have a clue. They'd been attending at this congregation since they were knee-high to a grasshopper, as we used to say, and yet they were all looking at me with a blank stare. I tried to get them to retell me the story. They didn't know it. This same church, by the way, is the church where they had Bert and Ernie coloring books in the little smaller classes, Sesame Street coloring books, and that was the class. That was the Bible class. Let them color for 45 minutes, and then the parents will come and pick them up. No wonder they're not learning. But look, it doesn't start at the church level. It starts in the home, doesn't it? Did you hear about the mother that was reading her Bible out loud to her little baby? her little baby and someone said you don't really seriously think your baby understands a word you're saying do you well no not right now he doesn't but uh, someday he will and I would love for one of his first memories to be remembering mama read the bible to me that would be a wonderful thing and our fathers have a responsibility to take this notice make it known to their children so that the generation to come might know them and uh, even the children that haven't even been born yet so they could arise and declare it to their children this is supposed to be a per self perpetuating thing i get taught and then i teach others who teach others who teach others and here's the problem a lot of the biblical principles that used to be taught in the home are no longer being taught in the home, and that's why we're having a lot of homes that are getting weaker and weaker and weaker. This book is no longer the centerpiece of education. And I'm all for true education. It even includes the board of education. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, this is a picture of Michael. <laughs> When he was small, smaller, mama had told him, son, I have paid for the last pair of church pants that I'm going to pay for that you just go out after services and ruin by sliding down that hill. You do that one more time and we're going to apply the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge. Well, as you can tell from the photograph, which I took behind his back, literally, you'll notice there are streaks of dirt here. Now, by the way, this is after the spanking, and you'll notice the embrace. What is it designed to say? What happened just now is not me rejecting you, it's me instructing you. I love you. And I don't love you any less now than I did before. In fact, I love you even more. I want you to know there is a right, there is a wrong, and that when you violate the right and you do wrong, there are consequences. 
Do our children need to learn that so that they understand the day of judgment consequence that awaits if they don't respect their heavenly Father's will and do what's right according to His righteous standard? So someone says, you don't really believe that that old-fashioned book about spanking, do you? I, I absolutely do, and I want you to strengthen the American home with me, or any home that, for that matter, by going with me to Proverbs. I want you to see that God put this in there, and the passage of time has not in any way, shape, or form diminished it. In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse number 24, He that spareth his rod shall be declared parent of the year. Is that what your Bible says? No. He that spareth his rod is compassionate toward their children. No. He that spareth the rod does what? Hates his son. No. I love them. That's why I'm not spanking them because I love my child. Other people, they don't love theirs. Well, my friends, my parents loved me a lot when I was growing up. And uh, I needed it. I needed to be educated about what was right, what was wrong. And you'll notice, he that loveth him chasteneth him. And the King James has this word betimes, meaning early on. Someone went into a sculptor's workshop. They saw two sculptures of a head. One of them very sharply defined. The nose was clear, the ears very distinct, uh, the mouth, the eyes. It was all very sharply chiseled. Right next to it was a sculpture that obviously came from the same mold but didn't have the same definition. And someone asked the sculptor, what happened here? These obviously came from the same mold but one of them doesn't look like it took the impression. He said, I'll be honest with you, that's my fault. I waited too long for the impression to take before I tried to stamp the impression on this one. I'd let it cool too much. Now, parents, when do you and I need to start teaching our children this respect for authority? Very early on. When our oldest son was uh, just getting to the age where he could walk around on his own, toddling along, there was some condensation on an end table that had come from a drink, and it had formed a little puddle of water there, a small puddle. And he came over and he put his hands in it and he was going like that and spraying things. And I, I said, you know, don't do that. And then he put his hand in there again. And I said, let me see your hand for a minute. And I gave it a little small rap. It didn't hurt him at all, but you would think that I'd shot him with a bazooka. <laughs> he fell down as if, oh, this is the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life. And it was all designed to be, you know, how could you? Well, when he got over his little tantrum, he got up, and that water was still there. He, got over, he put his hand as close to the edge of the water as he could without actually touching the water, and then looked at me and went. <laughs> and buddy, I thought, you're challenging the very borders of authority, aren't you? Well, give me your hand. Well, wait a minute, he didn't know, but what was the purpose of that? It was almost as if to say, yeah, you know, I, I may be not getting into the water literally, but I want to, and I'm going to get as close to it. I didn't want him growing up thinking that's the way you ought to do. Get as close to things as you ought to. Listen, no one enjoys spanking their child, and I'm not even suggesting that's the first go-to method of discipline in all cases and circumstances. There are things that, uh, any of you have multiple children, you know this is true. One of your children you could give a stern look to. That was enough, right? They're going to straighten up and fly right. They're not going to push the envelope. But then there's that other child. The one that's like, I'm going to uh, outlast you. And then the parent has to say back, no, you won't. I can't let you outlast me. Because that's going to send you all of the wrong messages. And so look at Proverbs 19 and verse 18. In this passage, chasten thy son. Is there any urgency to the timing of this? Chasten thy son while there is hope. You can wait so long to try to stamp the impression that you don't uh, get a sharply defined impression. And when it says, let not thy soul spare for his crying, I used to 
uh, teach it this way, and I still think it's a, a true statement, but I don't think as I've looked at the language a little more that it's really what this passage is saying as much. I used to say, well, don't let his crying keep you from doing it. But if you look at the language here, it's most literally in the Hebrew text. The marginal note you have in your Bible, let not thy soul spare to his destruction, to cause him to die. Wait a minute, you mean if I refuse to chasten my son as he needs chastening, I might cause him to die? Yes. How could I cause him to die by refusing to chasten him? Because I'm going to leave him, leave him with the false impression, you don't have to follow anyone's rules, and then God's rules are preached to him, and his attitude is what? I'm on my own. I'm in charge of my own life. Any school teachers in here? Oh yeah, we've got some school teachers in here. My wife is a school teacher. Do any parents ever leave the impression with their children, I don't care what the teacher says you did, darling, I know you didn't. And I know that you could do no wrong. It's always going to be the teacher's fault. It's always the teacher's fault. And you teach that long enough to young people and guess what they're going to grow up believing? It's never my responsibility to own up to my own transgressions. Somebody else is responsible. Now I want you to notice Proverbs 22 and verse 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Well, whose child? <laughs> Yours? Yeah. Mine? Yes. That's not just someone else's child. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. And right on the heels of this, I want to look at Proverbs 23 with you, which says there in verses 13 and 14. Withhold not correction from the child. If you beat him with a rod, he won't die. Thou shalt beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Someone says, wait, that's, that sounds pretty harsh and pretty strong. Well, look, it's talking about a measured dose. I'm going to ask this question, and I want a show of hands if I can get it. Mom or dad, if you're the one, if you are sitting in this room right now and you took your children to get a vaccination from the doctor, I'd like to see your hands go up. If you took your child to get a vaccination, look at this, all these barbarians in this room. Because let me ask you something, did you know that your child was going to cry before they even did? Did you know this action on your part would introduce pain into their lives? Did you know it, yes or no? And you did it anyway? How could you be so cold hearted and cruel? And what would you say back to me? No. Cold hearted and cruel is saying there's something that's more painful than a shot that stings for about 10 seconds and then it's over. There's something much more painful than that. That's the disease. If I love my child, I'll let them go through a little minor pain now to avoid a greater pain later, correct? Well, how does that work with hellfire? Would that hurt? Does eternal punishment hurt? My friends, you know there's no way for me to properly categorize. I would rather experience, I would rather experience some temporary pain in this life to keep me from that kind of eternal life than I would to experience eternal punishment because I got my way all the time on earth and no one ever had the courage to stand up to me. The Duke of Wellington was asked, what did you uh, remember most about your visit to America? He said, I guess it would probably be how well the parents obey their children over there. That's not a compliment, is it? And you know, in my house, I never did get the impression that I was in charge. I always thought that I was under their authority. And that needs to be kept in mind. But I'll tell you what, I preached at a congregation which shall remain nameless. There was a little boy that had, he was four years old, he just got him a brand new pair of boots and they were sharp toed. I mean, had a sharp point on them. After services, he was going around and kicking people as hard as he could with those boots and then running away laughing, thinking it was hilarious. And then he kicked sister so-and-so and she, her skin was paper thin. If she bumped into a door jam, she'd bleed. Imagine how much she was bleeding after a four-year-old boy who had a little size on him for his age kicked her as hard as he could. 
She's bleeding everywhere. There are personnel there at the front who work in the medical industry that were attending to her needs. Now the father didn't see the boy do it and I thought, you know, if it had been my son and had done this, I'd want to know about it so I could correct it at home. And so I just went to the father and I said, look, um, I just wanted to tell you what I saw. I know as a father, if you see my child doing something like this, tell me because I can't fix what I don't know about. Here's what I saw. And so he said, okay, well, thanks for telling me. And he picked his boy up and he went down to where sister so-and-so sat on the front bench. And he said, um, you apologize to her. And he said, no. He said, now you, you apologize to her. Do you see that you hurt her? Do you see that she's bleeding? You apologize to her. And the boy said, no. And hauled off and slapped his father across his face, leaving a big red handprint there for everyone to see. His father reached up and rubbed the slapped area and said, now we've talked about this. You know how much I hate it when you do that. Please don't do that anymore, okay? And we're all standing there incredulous. You apologize to her. You see that you hurt her. You apologize to her. And this time the boy said no, and he cocked his head back and spit in his father's face. Now, at this point, some of us were wanting to initiate emergency adoption proceedings <laughs> so that we could address this issue. But this father reached up and wiped away the spittle from his face and said, you know I don't like it when you do that. I told you I don't like that. Now you do. Somehow, he, boy, the boy never did apologize. The father walked away in defeat. And somehow the elders nominated me to go visit this family by myself. <laughs> I really wish they'd come with me, to be honest with you. And so I went. Now, you remember how old I told you their boy is? Four years old. The mother comes out to me, and she comes walking across the room with a book, and she says, you need to read this book right here. It will explain some things to you. And I looked at it, and it was Dr. Spock's book on child rearing, which, by the way, you may not know, he recanted and said that his earlier writings were entirely too permissive. But even if he'd never recanted, I just happened to have, of course, my Bible with me, and so I took the book she brought me, and I took the book God gave us, and I just held them up, and I said, now, which of these two would be the best go-to manual for how to raise children? Which one? Well, she kind of reluctantly nodded toward the Bible, but she said, that's based on biblical principles. You need to read that chapter of the terrible twos. Her child was four years old. So I read the chapter twice. To, what, what, why would she tell me the chapter on the terrible twos is what I need to understand about her four-year-old child? Friends, the bottom line is, this child was running that house. And I've seen it in so many cases and places. The children are running the house. And the parents are not in charge. So don't be surprised if your child gets older and thinks they don't have to respect anyone else's authority because they never were made to respect yours. Look at Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19. Can I ask you this before we go to this passage? When you got that vaccination, when your child got that vaccination, uh, did the doctor come in and take a needle and just start jabbing and stabbing wildly in all kinds of different directions? Or did he pick him out a spot and aim and inject the dose and then he was done? It was done in a very rational, orderly fashion, wasn't it? Did the doctor come in without a control temper? No. Very measured dose. My friends, I'm suggesting to you that when you are upset with your child, let yourself calm down and then inject the dose in a measured way. Pick your spot, aim for it, and inject the dose. But do it in a measured way because your child is definitely needing to know this as well. Proverbs 29, this is so important to couple with this. In Proverbs 29, 17, 
Verse 15, actually, the rod and reproof give wisdom. If your child is spanked, but he never knows why, or she never knows why, and you've never explained to them why, don't be surprised if they misinterpret the reason. You know, children amaze me at what they can understand about this, and my, my, one of my children definitely proved this to me. We were out of town somewhere, and he had done something that I told him, if you do that again, I'm going to have to spank you this time. You've been warned, and don't do it again. Well, he did it. We had like six, seven, eight hour drive home from where we were. And frankly, by the time I got home, I was exhausted and beat. And I thought, oh yeah, I promise that. So he came in the room. I gave him a couple of uh, half-hearted swats on the backside and started to go to hug him. And he's, his brother and sister still make fun of him for this. But he actually said to me, he said, are you trying to teach me that my behavior is acceptable? I said, excuse me? You've always said that the reason you spank us is to make it hurt just enough so that we don't want to do that behavior again. That didn't hurt at all. Where's my motivation? Not to engage in this behavior again. I said, okay, bend over. <laughs> and I proceeded to give a healthier dose this time than the first time. His brother and sister, man, what were you thinking? Just hush. But what it told me was, he, he heard me. This isn't dad's had a bad day, so let me take it out on you. This is designed deliberately for behavior modification. It's not to vent parental anger. And you know... We've got to teach our children that we mean business about this. Look at verse 17 of Proverbs 29. Correct thy son and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he'll give delight to your soul. I tell you this as I start to close out here. There was a place where I stayed one time and they had a charming, darling little uh, four-year-old boy. I think it was three or almost four. And... Uh, Every night at bedtime, I, I watched the following take place. The mother would start trying to get him into the mode to think, hey, it's, you got to go to bed now. Tonight, no arguments, okay? Tonight, when I put you down for bed, that means bed, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He puts her down, puts the child down. He gets up, comes out. She says, what are you doing up? I want to play. No, no, I told you it's bedtime. You go back and, and get in bed. So she'd go there he'd come back out she'd go put him in there he'd come back out she'd go put him in there he'd come back out I watched this woman get exhausted and one night she plopped down and she said I just wish I knew of a way to get that boy to go to bed and stay in bed I just wish I knew and this is one of those times when you're thinking should I or shouldn't I should I or shouldn't I I don't want to ruin this friendship I don't want to damage anything or act like I'm some kind of parental know-it-all because I'm not but I know this book has all the answers, right? I said, I think I know of a way. Are you serious? What, did you see it on 2020 or something like that? I said, no. I, I said, just go with me on this. I said, tomorrow night, tell him this. I said, now, unless you're sick and you need mommy or unless it's an emergency and you really have to go to the bathroom or something, once you go down for bed, you're, you're in bed and you stay there. And if you get up, I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to give you a little swat on the backside to tell you not to do that anymore. And I said, when you do that, he's going to act like you just killed him and fall on the floor and act like you broke his legs and this, that, and the other. And I said, so you're going to have to have the courage to ignore that. And I can promise you this, since this is not normal for him and you put him down, he's going to test it again. And you may have to do it several times before he finally says, hey, there's a new sheriff in town. And I don't think it's me. Next night, she told him, if, if you get up, I'm going to have to give you a swat on your backside. He came right out. She said, are you sick? No. I want to play. She said, what did I tell you? She said, let me get, and so she gave him a, a swat, if you want to call it that. He fell on the floor and went into conniption fits and uh, 
I, you know, if you would think we need to call 911 the way he was acting, but he was acting. So she put him down again. He came back out and she said, see, it's not working. I said, remember, you've got to outlast him. You've got to outlast him. So she gave him another swat, this time with a little more force. He went back and laid down. He came back out. She gave him another swat. He went back and laid down. He never came back out. Next night, she did this twice. He never came back out. The next night, she gave him one swat. He never came back out. And she kept looking at the door jam, thinking he was about to come around the corner, and then finally said, he's dead. <laughs> I know it. I said, no, he's not. He's not dead. I, I said, go check on him. She went in there, and she looked, and there he was, sleeping like a little angel. And she came back out. I'll never forget. She got on the phone. She called her sister in California, and she said, guess what I'm doing right now? Guess what I'm doing right now? I'm just relaxing and talking to you without any distractions. This is fantastic. This is wonderful. And question, could she have had that rest much, much sooner if she'd had the willpower to practice the endurance contest and the win from the get-go? And that's what we parents have to realize. Now, this isn't crushing their will. It's shaping their will to be in conformity to someone else's authority, which is a very good advice. Now, as I close out, I, I want you to know that if you don't demonstrate the things you educate, then your children and mine are never going to believe that we're serious about what we do. We read in the papers, we hear on the air of killing and stealing and crime everywhere. We sigh and we say as we notice the trend, this young generation, where will it all end? But can we be sure it's their fault alone that maybe most of it isn't really our own? Too much money to spend, too much idle time, too many movies of passion and crime, too many books not fit to be read, too much of evil and what they hear said, too many children encouraged to roam by too many parents who won't stay at home. Kids don't make the movies. Kids don't write the books that paint this picture of gangsters and crooks. Kids don't make the liquor, they don't run the bars, they don't pass the laws or make high-speed cars. Kids don't make the drugs that addle the brain, that's all done by older folk, greedy for gain. And so in so many cases, it must be confessed, the label delinquent fits older folks best. Children are watching us and they know whether we really are sincere about our faith. And when both parents are faithful to the Lord, meaning they attend regularly and they participate actively in the work of the church, about 93% of their kids were said to have remained faithful to that particular uh, teaching. If only one of the parents was faithful, the figure dropped to 73%. And in homes where only one parent attends, and that only infrequently, and not involved in the work, 53% of those remained faithful to what they'd been taught. And finally, most disturbing of all, in cases where both parents attend, but they only attend infrequently, the percentage of their children that remained faithful to what they'd been taught was 6%. We've got to demonstrate that we really mean what we say. And then next to last, participate. We've got to be involved in their lives. Socrates said, could I with, uh, climb the highest place in Athens? I, I'd lift my voice and say, fellow citizens, why are you turning and scraping every stone to gather wealth and you take so little care of your children to whom one day you may re must relinquish it all? Take a moment to listen today to what your children are trying to say. Listen today whatever you do or they won't be there to listen to you. Listen to their problems. Listen for their needs. Praise their smallest triumphs and praise their smallest deeds. Tolerate their chatter and amplify their laughter. Find out what's the matter and find out what they're after. But tell them that you love them and though you scold them, be sure you hold them. Tell them everything's all right. Tomorrow's looking bright. Take a moment to listen today to what your children are trying to say. Listen today, whatever you do, and they'll come back to listen to you. I had a dog once, and I often sat down beside that dog and petted it, trained it, chased a stick, took it with me, hunting, fishing. I love that old dog, someone wrote. 
I, oh, I had a car once. I really liked that car. I mean, I took care of it, always made sure it had the proper fuel and oil and necessities. It took me a lot of places. Oh, I love that old car. I had me a set of golf clubs once. We spent many happy hours together. I always took care of them, cleaning, scrubbing them after every round. I love those old clubs. I had a child once. Very seldom did I sit down to talk and play with the child. I didn't see that he was fed the correct amount of spiritual food. After his daily rounds, I seldom asked him how his day was. I was too busy complaining about mine. Time went by and my dog died. My car wore out. My golf clubs broke and that didn't bother me because I could replace those. But my child, I lost him. That's something that can never be replaced by anyone or anything. And so I want to participate in their lives and make sure I'm connected. And finally, it's about prayer and supplication. I know mothers who, who pray before they ever find out they're having a baby. They're already praying as a couple for being the kind of parents they should be when they do. Brother Taylor tells of the story, and I may not remember all of the details correctly, but my recollection is in one of his books he wrote about a soldier that was tempted to participate in some activities that he should not participate in with his fellow soldiers. And he was going to think about doing so, and then he started doing the math in his head and calculated and remembered what time it was back home and where his mother was, Wednesday night prayer meeting. And he knew what his mother was praying, and it wasn't that he go out and do what he was being encouraged to do. The memory of a praying mother helped this boy. I started carrying very close to my heart a laminated obituary of my mother who passed on March the 4th. And when I preach, I keep it in my left pocket right close to my heart. Because my mom taught me about God. She strengthened my life in ways I wish I could tell her even more how much I appreciate. And someday I will. I, I hope maybe if the Lord lets me live and preach a long time, you come up to me 25, 30 years from now and say, Brother Clark, you still got your little bookmark, and I'll pull it out, and it'll be tattered and worn with time. But the memory of what I learned at the hands of my mom and dad will be no less sweet. It will be even sweeter. And someday, I get to go to heaven and be with my Savior. It's worth taking every minute you can invest in your children, in your home. We love you, and we want you to love God because He's given us the greatest home of all to look forward to.